afternoon, wherever you are in the world today. Welcome to this episode of The Living Word. Hi, I'm Lynn Hardy, and I'm here today to bring you a message from our Lord. We know according to his word that the word is living and it is active. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. And we're here today with a message from Jesus, who is the word. So today's message is about demonic activity in the lives of people. It is the part two of a series um, devoted to emotional attacks upon people. So let's go ahead and get started here today. There are three levels of influence that I have identified that can come upon a person. It is depression, oppression, and possession. Examining how the enemy operates in these three levels may help us spot an intrusion into our lives that could hinder us from moving forward with the Lord and receiving all that he has for us. Level one is depression. Now, the root word of depression is depress, which means to reduce strength or activity. And the suffix on there, the I-O-N, denotes a condition. So when you combine the root word and the suffix together, what you get is the condition of being reduced in strength or activity. This is the most subtle and the most common form of an attack from the demonic realm. If our adversary can reduce our activity, can deplete our strength, then we are not taking as much ground for the kingdom of God as we could. You know, just as the more conventional meaning of depression suggests, this is a mental attack. And it can be as subtle as demons are who are assigned to us just put these thoughts into our mind let's go ahead and take a look at this within the word of god so you are aware of this tactic of the enemy in hebrews 1 14 the amplified classic version it says this are not the angels all ministering spirits all servants sent out in the service of God's for the assistance of those who inherit salvation. So the word of God tells us that each one of us has an, have angels sent to help us from God. Satan is a fallen angel and one of the most powerful. He was an archangel and he is an imitator of God. But he, unlike God, is neither omnis, omnipotent or omnipresent. That means he can't do everything. He's not all powerful. Neither is he all knowing. He can't be at more than one place at, at a time. So he's limited. So just like God has a network of his angels who can communicate with him and he knows everything that are assigned, so does Satan. He has this network of, of little demons doing his work. So the old concept of a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other isn't far from the truth. You see, Satan assigns one of his demons, or sometimes more than one, to each person. The sole job of these little imps is to follow you around and prevent you from reaching your full potential with God. Now, these are very low-level imps. They don't have a ton of power. All they can do really is interject thoughts into your mind, try and trip you up and get you veered off the path up to your destiny. Thus giving, but every time they, they succeed, every time you listen to them, they get more and more power in your life. Let's look at that in the word of God. Second Corinthians 10 verses five. We are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. You see, we this is what it says that we are to do. We have to take every thought captive. Now, in, we are inherent, inherently sinful. We are born in sin. We have a sinful nature. So there are some thoughts that just come 
because, well, we're not perfect. Our thought life is not perfect. However, there are other thoughts that are actually an attack from the enemy. Both type of thoughts need to be taken captive. And we can either renounce it or dismiss it, just you know, push it away. There are many that argue that attempting to control our thoughts is futile. I like what the German theologian Martin Luther said. He said, you cannot keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. That is a perfect metaphor for thoughts. You know, if a thought flies into your head, that's one thing. But it's what happens when it gets there. Does it build a nest? Do we continue to dwell on it? Do we give the destructive or sinful thoughts a place? When these wrong thoughts are acknowledged and even accepted by speaking them out loud or acting upon them, then that demon assigned to us gains ground. He begins building that nest in our mind. Here's what the Bible says about obeying sin, fall coming into agreement with it. Romans 6, 16 through 22. Do you not know that if you continually surrender yourself to anyone to do his will, you are the slaves of him whom you obey? Whether that be to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. That word righteousness means right doing, right standing with God. So who do you want to be in agreement with? Who do you want more of in your life? Do you want more of God and Jesus and, and his stuff in your life? Or are you wanting to surrender to the enemy? If you continually submit to an enemy, you are obeying him. And that, that enemy will have more and more power. You will become his slave, doing his bidding. Eventually, if you continue doing this, it will lead to the next step, which is oppression. Before we go into oppression, let's take a look about demonic attachments. How to tell. So if you have a demonic attachment, if you have a demon who is attacking you through depression, how do you tell? A demonic attachment is simply a place in your life that has been You've given over to the enemy repeatedly. And that, as I said, that demon gets more influence upon you. Some may refer to this as a stronghold. Here's how that can happen. A pastor at a large church once had a vision from the Lord about what happens and how demons get a place. Two women were talking. They were facing each other. And a demon sat on the shoulder of each one. A demon would whisper in one, one woman's ear, and she would speak harsh, critical statements about the pastor of the church. The demon on the other woman's shoulder, woman two, would whisper and into that woman's ear, and that woman would speak, exaggerating some little thing. This continued for some time, each responding to what they were hearing from these spirits. One woman would speak and the demon would throw up something on that woman. So as they came into agreement with the, the, what the demon was saying, the, this demon threw up this green goo all over the woman. The more they spoke, the more the demon threw up on them until it, it's like they were a cocoon in um, surrounded by this green goo and unable to really move much. You see, the sin here the women that the women were committing was gossip. And the consequences of, of the repeated sin was that the demons were gaining influence over them, just as Paul stated to those in Rome. Romans 6.16, do you not know that when you continually offer yourselves to someone to do his will, you are slaves of him that you obey? Jesus paid the price for our sin. So it doesn't send us to hell, but it can give the enemy power over us in this life. We may become his slave if we repeatedly and continually sin. In prayer sessions, I have seen cement blocks attached to people or chains or webs, many other things holding God's people in place. 
under slavery, under bondage. Only by turning from the sin, allowing the demon access, and accepting the payment of the blood of Jesus for it, can we truly be set free. The result of this freedom can be healing. It can be physical, emotional, or even financial. And always, you'll, you'll receive more peace from God. That shalom that Jesus talks about, that, you, that only he can give you. Now, each person's life is unique. An attachment, you know, this um, first level of depression, can look as different in our lives as we look different from each other. Often, there is something that we know that we shouldn't be doing that is a sin. But we just can't stop doing it. It can be drinking, smoking, sleeping around, gossiping, a hundred little things. But it's the Holy Spirit who reveals what the enemy is using in your life. Now, if you are not yet hearing from the Holy Spirit who will reveal the enemy and, and, and give you nudges and hints of where you're going wrong, then I hope you will begin learning at the online Christian church and come and talk with us about it. That is what the Lord has had us do is put free classes online so you can understand God's ways and allow you to come and talk with us and even receive intercession so the Holy Spirit can I help you identify where these intrusions are in your life. Our Heavenly Father designed you for a perfect destiny. He designed you to be in relationship with him, to have more of him in your life. He calls you son and daughter. If you need help getting there with God, if you need help receiving more of him from him, that is why he sent us. Your life will feel complete as never before when you are walking close with your heavenly father through Jesus as your Lord. Now that second level, now we can go on to the second level, which is oppression. So once you are operating like those two women with a demon for a long time and, and they have cemented themselves into your life, then that sin can lead to oppression. The definition of oppression is continued, unjust, or cruel treatment or control. This is where demonic assaults begin affecting your body. Many people who've had a gift of seeing in the spirit realm have described what they see as black masses attached to people's body, like a fungus or a growth affecting different areas. These demons are similar to leeches. They can attach themselves to you and they will feed off the authority you have given them by continuing in sin. Again, oppression is one of these things that can show up in so many ways, more ways than I can list here. The Bible doesn't record every way it can show up, but it does say this about oppression. Let's look at Acts 10 verses 38. This is the amplified classic version. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with great power. And he went around doing good and healing all who are oppressed by the devil because God was with him. This clearly shows that as a result of oppression, the result of oppression is can be a physical condition that needs healing because healing occurred in connection with removing the oppression. So we see that being oppressed by the devil may put you in need of healing. And it shows that Satan can be the cause of some physical ailments. Can mere thoughts lead to physical infirmities? Recent studies about the way our brain works show that when you think about any topic and if you do it repeated, repeatedly, it forms a physical neural pathway in your brain that are easily accessed. The more you, you think about something, the quicker your brain is to access that route for thought. 
It's like it builds a highway with every time you think about something, it, a little highway inside your mind. The more days you think about the same topic, the bigger that highway gets. The Bible actually supports this. It talks about it this way. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 in the English Standard Version. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Presenting our bodies means to keep sin out of our lives. And if, it, if the world says it's okay, it doesn't mean it's okay. It's what God says is okay. Keep the world and the world's sin out of our physical bodies. Our brains need a constant dose of goodness and truth that we're to renew our minds, to think on that which is good. That is the word of God. Putting the word, the right word in your heart and mind can lead to a transformation. It will help us to quickly understand what is from God and what isn't. The Bible specifically encourages us to focus on one type of material. Philippians 4, 8, the Amplified Classic Version. Finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, Whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there's anything excellent, if it, there's anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. Before man knew that there were pigs that carried parasites, that disease could be transmitted to man. The Bible called them unclean and said not to eat it. Before we knew heavy metals and shrimps and eels would cause sickness, God told his people not to eat them because he knew that they would affect the body. Now top neurologists have finally discovered that repetitive thinking establish, establishes pathways in the brain. Did you know harmful ones? There are actually harmful neural pathways um, if it's thoughts that are of anger, if there are thoughts of, of sin like lust, if there are thoughts uh, of um, hate, there's, if, there's, if they're sinful thoughts, the, the, the pathways are actually all twisted and black and corrosive. And thinking about them releases, going down those neural pathways when they light up, it releases destructive materials into our system. It's trauma anger. These, these are caustic pathways. And research shows that 87% of all diseases are connected to the re release of the toxins that the brain releases into our system with these thoughts. Repetitive negative thought pa patterns are highways allowing spiritual oppression to come. It's a good thing science has finally caught up with God. And Christians are not immune from this type of attack. That is why the New Testament tells us how to avoid them, to how to focus our mind on God and not on these negative things. Through Jesus, we can take every thought captive and we need to. Now, sometimes an attachment has formed and we are oppressed by sickness. The half-brother of our Lord shows us that when we're oppressed, we may need help to be set free. This is James chapter 5, verse 14 through 16, English Standard Version. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of, church, of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of, the faith, or the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power in its working. The Lord has provided for those who are oppressed with sickness. 
but we have a part to play. We must be willing to confess our sins so that we may be healed. Much of the Christian community has forgotten what the word confess means and what constitutes sin. We hope you will learn about that. A great place to start is the online Christian church. Now, if there is a moment of shock or trauma, remember there there was not only sin, but it was trauma that could lead to this negative pathway. So if there's a trauma in your life that keeps you focusing on it, remember Jesus is the healer of the brokenhearted. Please come and talk with us. Schedule a let's chat so we can get you started on the path of what you need to know so Jesus can heal that trauma and set you free. Let's move on now to the third level. The third level is possession. We're going to go straight to the word of God concerning this. When he arrived at the other side of the country of the Gadarenas, two demon-possessed men came out of the tombs to meet him. The Greek word, domenzain, is translated as possessed. In some variations of the Bible, it's translated demonized. To be demonized means to be under the control or influence of evil spirits. When you are possessed by something, you are owned by it. That means the demon may have the ability to take complete control of your body. This is the root of the terminology, possession. To understand how a Christian may be possessed, we first need to understand how God made us. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. This is the English Standard Version. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our spirit is the part of us that is connected to God. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. When you look at the root of these Greek words, that is what it tells us, is that the soul, when it mentions soul, is the mind, the will, and the emotions. The body here, the body is the part that keeps us connected to this world. It's necessary because we live in this world. When we take Jesus as our Lord, the Holy Spirit comes into our spirit and the combining makes us a new creation. We are born again. That's what Jesus said in in John chapter three, verses three through eight. You see, demons, when they possess us, they do not possess our spirits. They possess our soul, and our mind. That's our mind, our will, and our emotions. And through our mind, our will, and our emotions, then they take control of our body. Since the Holy Spirit is in our spirit, they they can't touch that part of us. But as a Christian, it can come in and affect us. Now, over the years, I have seen levels of possession. Some Survivors of possession have described it as being able to see, but unable to to control so much as blinking their eye. For others, it's a brief loss of control. Some Some have a memory of it, some don't. Possession can occur in many different ways. But a few of the most common are this. Accidental invitation, rape, and rituals and traditions. Any of these actions have a possibility of dire consequences. The effects can be hard to spot and may show up the next day or may not even show up for the next year. But the enemy may still have rights to us and will use them as he desires. So let's look at all three to make sure that you're aware and don't fall into into this pit. Or if you are already in it, you can identify it. Okay? So, accidental invitation. A good portion of the world has forgotten how powerful the spirit realm is. Remember the word of God. It says that 
everything in the physical realm came from the spiritual realm. And which is more powerful, the thing that was given birth to or the thing that created it? That means the spiritual realm is more powerful than this physical realm. Because the world has forgotten how powerful the spiritual realm is because we can't contact it very easily and we have very little awareness of it. Because of that, many have begun to participate in games or activities that they see as harmless. But it may be an open door to great affliction. Using a Ouija board, seances, spirit writing, magic spells, witchcraft, reading tarot cards, doing fortune telling, anything that has to do with contacting the spirit world, including spirit guides, all of these that are, if they involve spirits that will not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh, that isn't, if it's not giving glory to God and to Jesus, then this is contact with the demonic realm, those who oppose God. It's aligned with Satan. They know some things. If you go in and have your, you know, to a palm reader or, or a fortune teller, they may know some things because that demon on your shoulder that's been with you, it's seen everything and it may talk to that person and that person will talk to you and, and say all these things that have happened in your life. And you'll be like, Oh my gosh, they know so much. They're just talking to that demon on your shoulder. Don't come into agreement with those things unless you want to give that demon and possibly new demons a place. Jesus told us a parable or a story. I don't think it was a parable. I think it was a story um, because he said a certain man, which means it actually happened. Um, so he told a story about a beggar named Lazarus and he showed us God's policy concerning the spirits of those who died. Let's look at that today. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who laid at his gate full of sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried away by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and he was buried. And in hell, he was lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And he sees Abraham afar off and he sees Lazarus in his bosom. And then he said, I pray, therefore, father, he's talking to Abraham, that you would send him to my father's house and Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers that that he, the beggar Lazarus, may testify to them lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he, the rich man said, no, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham said to him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. Wow. Talk about truth. Talk about coming true, right? Jesus laid, actually raised a guy named Lazarus from the dead. And the Pharisees, the Sadducees believe them not. Jesus himself rose from the dead and they believed him not. So when the rich man, he sought to have a spirit rise from the dead to speak and convince people of things, God said no. God does not allow the spirits of our dearly departed ones to guide us. There's good reason for this because it would, con it would contradict what his word says elsewhere. So let's go to that today. Here is Leviticus 20 uh, verse 6, and this is the King James Version. And the soul that turneth after such that has familiar spirits and after wizards to go to whore and after them, I will set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. There is a stiff penalty for associating with spirits who are not from God. It says familiar spirits, spirits that are familiar to us. This 
if we do this, God turns his face from us. This means we will lose God's favor. He will not hear us. His presence will not be with us. Now, familiar spirits are spirits that have been with us a long time. And so when somebody passes away, those demons who have been with them are familiar to us and our families, and they are looking for a new place. And they may, they know a lot about the person who's passed away, and they may pose as that person who's left. We cannot listen to spirits that rise from the dead, that are close to us, our family members. In Israel, when you were cut off from your people, as it says, God says to cut them off from the people, that meant you couldn't even go in the temple to pray or to offer sacrifices. You were rejected from God's people. This means your prayers will be hindered. You will be in danger of losing your salvation. Don't listen to any spirit that approaches you, that looks like someone who's left. Remember to test the spirits. I don't have this on a slide, so we, we talk about it in other classes, but I want to tell you here today, the word of God says to don't believe every spirit that appears, that Satan himself appears as an angel of light. Test them and ask, do you confess that Jesus the Christ has come in the flesh? They will not confess that because that puts them in agreement with Jesus as the Messiah, and they will flee or they'll distract you or they'll get mad. Even if Jesus appears to you, you ask him that question, he will rejoice. God himself will rejoice because you're doing what he said. Don't ever believe anyone who is talking to spirits, even if it's Jesus, God, or the Holy Spirit, if they're not testing them. They are, it may be demons seeking to trick them, to manipulate them. You have a choice in this life. You can either invite the Holy Spirit to come inside. That's what you do at salvation. Be guided by him or be guided by all these other, other things, other spirits in the world. You can't have both. Don't be doing horoscopes. That's looking to the wrong place. Look to God. That's an accidental invitation. Allowing spirits to come in your life. Okay, the second way you may actually be possessed is this. Rape. It is a horrible word. If you have ever been assaulted, sometimes even saying that word is hard. We call it all kinds of things, assaulted, molestation, but it's rape. That is one of the main ways a spirit can enter a person without their permission. I believe it's because our soul is damaged during the attack. And when our soul is damaged, then it allows a place for that spirit, another spirit to inhabit through that trauma. The Bible tells us that when a man and woman come together in intimacy and sex, they become one flesh. That's Mark 10 verses eight, verse eight. The merging of the flesh puts our souls in close contact. The trauma, the trauma of the, that experience, that wound, opens up that soul and gives the demon a place to go. In biblical times, many gods were worshipped with sexual acts. Though it's not specifically stated, it seems that there is something that that, that act it opens us up to the spiritual realm in some way. This is why we're supposed to wait until we commit to a lifetime relationship, a marriage with someone before we have intercourse. When we take those marriage vows before God, that moves him as a covering into our union and provides protection for us. Now, this theory, because I'm not say, saying it's a fact, it's, it, I believe this is the way it works, but... You have to ask the Lord for yourself, but it also explains why I've seen children who are conceived through rape. They're born possessed through no fault of their own. The children 
were not old enough to divide, invite a demon inside. The only common ground was their conception through rape. Regardless of how a spirit comes to be in a position of authority, one fact remains. God has provided a way to set us free. That trauma in the soul, it's called a soul wound. And Jesus is the healer of the brokenhearted. Our soul is also referred to as our heart. Jesus is the healer and he can set you free. If you have been a victim of this, there may be a few classes you need to learn so you know how this works, but come and talk to us at the online Christian church so that you can be set free from that horrible experience. The next part, the next way spirits can come into our life and we can be possessed by them is through rituals and traditions. Now, some cultures invite spirits inside of them through ceremonies. This isn't pre prevalent in America. It's in some small segments of America's society, but not like it is in other countries. It is still widely practiced outside of North America. We just don't know about it often. We're sheltered in many ways. But for those who have or are in a country where things like this are practiced. Let's talk about that a little bit because it's not just hmm, cultural uh, ceremonies. It's anything related to the occult. If it's a ritual um, that, that is done and related to occult practices, it will open a door to a demon. So the rituals and traditions associated with the spirit realm apart from God, it can be done alone, with a book in your hand, reading something online, out loud. It can be done during a wedding ceremony presided over by a shaman, a witch doctor, or someone calling themselves a prophet. Rituals and traditions. We must be careful if it if it's, has to do with the spiritual realm in any way. There are tribes in Africa. There, there still are. People are still living tribes. And these tribes have gods and totems and idols associated with them, including the representation of these gods, these totems in any part of our life, in any kind of ceremony, will open a door to the demons behind them. So you can't have, you know, their likeness on, on a dress or a, an outfit. You can't have those in your home. Actions and ceremonies based on tribal traditions are often, they often began as acts of worshiping other gods of that tribe. So you need to research your history. If you're doing any kind of tradition or ritual, participating in those traditions may allow a demonic influence into your life, may have a long time ago. And it may be why you're struggling in some ways. For those of us, all, for all of us, there are many Americans I know that think it's fun to chant spells, to pretend, to come into agreement with books they've read. But spells are actually, especially ones that are derived from uh, other languages and other traditions, they, they these chants are, are ways to instruct the spiritual realm and demons will do these actions. And so doing these spells may open a door to a demon coming into your life. Although books like Harry Potter make it seem acceptable to have witches and, and what and spells, the spells in those books were derived from real witchcraft ceremonies. Don't be pretending. The demons don't care if you're pretending and make-believing. They'll still take advantage because you've spoken the words, activating them in your life. And especially if you're asking for any kind of influence upon your body, you're just asking to be possessed. Don't do that. There are still ceremonies being practiced where family lines are being dedicated to other spirits, to other gods. 
in many nations, entire children and entire family lines are under oppression because of these ceremonies. When animal blood, sometimes even human blood, it might not be a life that is done, but if it's um, animal blood that is spilled or if it's human blood cutting yourself in some way, this will create a place that the blood cries out from and it doesn't go away. It creates a stronger bond for these demons. It will, you'll need to confess it to remove it. You'll need to understand that something has happened because this blood will cry out for the future generations. This can be done inside or outside of occult practices. And then when those later generations, this might've been done four generations ago. Think about that, four generations. That's your great, great, great grandmother or father. And then later on, those, those they become Christians, but if they haven't taken care of those things, they haven't taken care of those, those ceremonies and especially any blood stuff that has gone on, well, these demons will still have a place to hinder you. And there is something that has to be done to break this. We can see that in Acts. Let's go and look at that now because we want to see it within the word of God. Here's Acts 19 verses 18 through 19. Also, many of those who are now believers, they came confessing, divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them inside of all. And they counted the value of them and they found it came to 50 gold pieces. When you find out that your family line has been doing stuff, when, or if you have accidentally been involved in it, perhaps you've been reading from books and thinking it was harmless and contacting the spiritual realm, there are actions that are expected of you. You, have, you can't just give them away or sell these items. You need to destroy them. This is what God expects of you. Don't pass the items on to others who may then fall into enemy hands, no, destroy them. That is what God expects of us. We need to examine our life because possessions being possessed by, by demons, it's actually more common and harder to spot sometimes than you would think. The easy way to spot it is for those who are, that when the demon takes control of their body, and, you know, and they're not able to control it. Well, they definitely know something's wrong. Those people know that they are possessed. However, there's a whole other category of possession. Sometimes it's merely an uncontrollable emotional response. Remember, it takes place in your mind, your will, and your emotions. So it can be a, a re response such as anger. It can be a persistent struggle with an internal sin such as pride. That could mean that there was a demon that came inside at some point because of actions you took. And we need to identify hmm, those actions. We first, we need to identify and know that there's a possession issue. So we can ask the Lord where it began. Identifying this and depression or oppression from the enemy can be a bit difficult on our own. But praise God, we have a counselor, the Holy Spirit, who will help us. He will help us identify things and get clear one step at a time if we're willing. So let's talk about that next. I don't want to leave you here. I actually had only this part done this morning, but then the Lord said no. He said, show them how to remove the demonic activity from their lives. So that's what I'm going to do. We're going to continue. One of the ways demonic activity can come in is, as we've mentioned, is a curse. How a curse comes into our life, what it means, and all this kind of stuff, we talk about that in another class. It's called identifying the enemy. That's a whole class. So let's just say that um, if you are afflicted by a demon, the cause may be a curse. God is a big and mighty God. He can do all things. 
So I am not going to limit him today in any way, because I know he has many ways to free his people from things from the enemy, some of which may be called a curse. But what I do know is that there's two categories, two types of removals that can be done in dozen different ways. So let's look at those two types and look at it in the word of God. The first type is that sometimes relief from demonic activity, whether it's depression, oppression, or possession can happen instantly in a moment. The demon's gone and we're free and we're healed. That sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> and that can happen. So let's look at it in the word of God. Here is Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 and 8. This is Jesus saying, And as you go, he's instructing his disciples when he's sending them out. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leopards, drive out demons. Freely without pay you have received, freely without charge, give. This is one type, one type of, of a way that God can do, free us. If people have never heard the gospel, the good news about God's son who came to set them free, then the Lord may empower you. It's, it's the job of evangelist to spread that initial word that God has sent his son and he's here to set you free. Well, you can't expect people who want to be set free to learn. First, you have to pray and with the Lord's telling you to, the Lord's telling you to pray and he will empower you to set them free so they know that God is more powerful than that enemy, that Jesus is king over heaven and earth. After that, they can learn about God. If they don't know anything about God, then they are not expected to do anything. It's up to you. It's your faith because God has told you to do that. He's empowered you to do that. And that is one way that demons can be removed from people. Here is another way. We are going to look at this in the word of God. James 5, 16, Amplified Classic Version. Confess to one another, therefore, your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins. And pray also for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous, powerful, available. It's dynamic and it's working. In 1 Corinthians eleven thirty to 32, the American King James, it says, For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we were to judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. These are two scriptures that show that once we are Christians, there's something that is expected of us. We are expected to learn God's ways and turn from sin to be set free. We have to judge ourselves, examine our lives so we can remove that which is not from God. But again, God is merciful. And sometimes when we're in a place where his anointing is flowing, we may be set free without first confessing those sins, but that comes with a big danger. Let's, let me show that to you in scripture. This is Matthew 12, 43 to 45, the Amplified Classic for, Version. This is the Lord speaking. And he says, when, an, when the unclean spirit has gone out of, person, of a person, it passes through the waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes out and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. So also it will be with this evil generation. Now, in this verse, the house is your body. If it is all in order, then it's healed, it's functioning well, things are good. If a demon is cast out, a healing may come for a season. But that demon will come back to see if sin has still left that door open for it to enter in once more. And, your, and it, 
if it finds that there's still an open door through sin, that there's still a place available, guess what? It's going to bring seven more evil and worse, stronger demons. And the condition will be worse than when it began. So if you are healed and you are set free and you have not sought God's ways and you have not corrected your path, then that healing you've received may disappear. And oftentimes you'll be worse than before. Jesus himself showed this principle when he healed and set people free, healed people and set them free from demons. Let's look at our Lord and what he did. John 8, verses 10 and 11, English Standard Version. Jesus stood up to her and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. You notice she called him Lord, meaning owner, master. She was submitting to him. And then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go on now and sin no more. This is the record, the testimony of where Jesus set Mary Magdalene free. We know that she was freed from seven demons, and Jesus tells her to go sin no more. If you are oppressed by the enemy and you're set free, listen to the words of the Lord and sin no more. Now let's look one more because that's only one scripture. Let's look for it again. Now there was a man who had been healed and he did not know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in in the place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and he said to him, see, you are well, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. This leaves little doubt that sinning after we've received healing, after a demon has been removed, can lead to horrible things. This is what Jesus said to the man who was paralyzed and couldn't walk. The man went and testified about his healing at the temple, but giving a testimony is not good enough. We see that Jesus' instructions are sin no more. If you don't know God's ways, how can you stop sinning? You better be willing to learn when you receive that healing. Have you seen shows where people are testifying about the amazing healings that have been coming out of wheelchairs? Well, a reporter researched those who had been healed in the tent crusades long ago, back I think in like in the 70s or 80s. And it was like five years after those crusades had ended. And the reporter had the list of the people who had been healed and he went around to them. And he found that 95% of people who had left their wheelchairs there at the front of the altar, they had gotten new wheelchairs. They were in the same or worse condition. We have forgotten to tell people, go and sin no more. Praise God that he has sent his spirit to guide us, to teach us. If you will seek him, if you will seek to learn his ways, They will not come back upon you. If we want to remain healed, we must be willing to draw close to God. One final note. What is the difference between demonic activity and that which would be in a trial or a test? What is the difference between the two? How do we know if this is just a test or a trial or if we really have an open door? Well, the Bible speaks of crowns given for work completed here on earth. At 2 Timothy 4.8, 1 Corinthians 9.25, James uh, verses, chapter 1, verse 12, 1 Peter 5, um, verses 2 through 4. And we know that there are treasures stored up for us in heaven for what's done. That's Matthew 6, 19 through 20. That was Jesus himself talked about it. But at the same time, the Bible also speaks about trials and tests that are given that we must pass or fail. So we have rewards here that we, for actions here on earth, we see those rewards are, are stored up in heaven, but they're because of trials and tests. So what is the difference between a trial and a test and an attack because of a, a open door to a demon? 
I have observed the following. Trials and tests repeat until you come through them without sinning. You've done something wrong. There's always an opportunity for to do something right or to do something wrong when it's a trial or test. In a test, you're being tested to see if you will hold to God's ways. An attack seems more random. There's often nothing we can do. It just hits us. There's not an opportunity to sin. So a trial and a test is an opportunity not to sin. And an attack comes because we have already sinned. There's no opportunity for our behavior to go one way or the other. If you aren't sure if you're suffering from an attack or a test, I encourage you to go through all the classes at the online Christian church. They will help you um, discern what is from the Holy, what the Holy Spirit is telling you. It'll help you show you God's ways and, and he'll, the Holy Spirit will reveal open doors. And so then you can see if, if there was a test that you failed or not. Mature Christians are available for free tutoring. All the, the courses are free. The tutoring is free. And they'll discuss the material with you so that you can understand it and apply it to your life. And then, of course, we are always there to chat with you as well and help you along your way and give you directions and interse intercession prayer. That is what the Lord has had for me to bring to you today. It is just about his will. He, he is here for you. Jesus wants you to be free. He paid the price for you to be free from demonic activity. But are you willing? Are you willing to seek him? Are you willing to do things his way? If you're willing, then you can be set free. I hope this helps you understand a little bit more about God's kingdom and the fact that he has an enemy. That enemy is looking for a place in your life. Until I see you again, may God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he grant you the long.